a huge Kobe Bryant fan, and I know just like many others are still facing the whole devastation of his accident with his daughter and the seven other victims that was on the helicopter. But I was just wondering, in hip hop, most of the times when they talk about the best rappers, they always say Tupac and Biggie have their own category. And I know Kobe Bryant, he played his full 20 years in the NBA, but I was thinking or wondering since his devastation, it was so sudden. Do you think going forward when they start doing, you know, debates and stuff of the greatest NBA players, do you think that pits Kobe in a different category or is it even disrespectful to even pit him in the category just because of the sudden incident that happened to him? Well, I mean, I think it's tried to do with the legacy that he left behind on the court. Uh, perhaps if he had still been playing, that would be the case. But, um, you know, he, he retired, um, what, four years ago, five years ago? Yeah. Um, so I think the debates that were going on then when he retired while he was playing um, are the same that will go on, you know, uh now since his his, uh, his passing, but um, you know, it, you know, before he died, Kirby was a legend uh, already. So you know, I don't think that um, uh, the sudden and tragic way in which he died uh, would or should have any effect on how he's viewed uh, as a basketball player or the legacy that he left behind on the court. I have an epiphany that if the L.A. Lakers win this year in 2020, that they're going to give a ring to Vanessa Bryan. Do you think that it's probably what may happen? I think if they would do that, the Laker family. I, I have no idea. <laughs> no. I, I really have no idea. Saturdays I'd be watching college football, we wouldn't necessarily be talking about it. College basketball during the week, NBA, always. Right. The, the job's 365 days, you know, so you're con you're constantly kind of keeping up on everything that's going on. You're not watching every single game. Right. Um, every single NFL game, yes, I do watch. Um, every major NBA matchup, yes, I do watch. Um, but. It's like in our business, it's it's like it's twenty four seven like news. Right. I can't. I don't go into work to find out what's going on. I go into work knowing what's going on and sharing my ideas in our production meeting. Right. I so, went. To, I went. But to, I love it. Good. So it's not. It's not work. So it never bores you. When no. You, even when you just you know watching. No, it on no, TV no. The only day I really like truly get out is Saturday. Okay. <laughs> That's it. That's right, like right. where I'm actually outside and maybe see the sun. Right. Which I'm not proud of that. That should be one of my goals for 2017. See the sun. Yes. Right, yeah. right, right. Now, I got a question. Mm -hmm. I went to Southern Connecticut. Okay. And Southern Connecticut, we have a lot of interns that always go to ESPN for uh -huh. interns and stuff. And one of the biggest things that um, one of my professors were talking mm -hmm. about was, so how I got Molly Kerm to be a guest on my program. It was really being at the right place at the right time. A couple years ago, I walked into a dance studio. I was friends with the owner. And I walked in and I saw this beautiful woman. She was gorgeous. And I was like, oh my God, she's so beautiful. But I was like, she looks so familiar. Like, I didn't know if I knew her or if I seen her somewhere. And I feel like I have a borderline photograph memory. So I was like, she looks so familiar. So it took me a few seconds to put the pieces together, but I was like, oh my God, first take, ESPN, she's the moderator, that's Molly. So at the end of her dance lesson, or she had taken a dance class, after the dance class, I um, went up to her and I said, my name is Maiko, and I admired her because she's from New Haven, I'm from New Haven, and she's where I want to be in the future. She's a great journalist, and I want to be at that same level where she's at now. And I said to her, would you like to be a guest on my show? And she said, sure. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I wish life was this easy. Like, you know, she didn't hesitate. 
and the fact that she gave me her time. I got to interview her. She was um, actually made a parent on the show. It was great. So that's how I got Molly, and I want to thank Molly for giving me her time. Well, I am going Patriots. Um, I think that Tom Brady will exploit that secondary. Um, and the only way I think Big Ben gets it done is if, you know, those killer bees, Le'Veon Bell and Antonio Brown, obviously, if they just really get hot early and start racking up the points. But I can just never count out Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. And he'll come up with some ridiculous game plan and expect the unexpected like you always do. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I see the Patriots back in the Super Bowl again. Were you surprised? Sorry, were yeah. you, I'm not a huge NFL person. Okay. I love NBA, but not. Yeah. Um, were you surprised on the whole Dallas? Because I don't hear Dallas fans anymore. I'm on Facebook and all these. Was I surprised, surprised that they the lost? Loss? Yeah. No, I wasn't because. Aaron Rodgers is the second best quarterback in the league to Tom Brady. He's incredible. He's the most athletic. Um, so no, I wasn't shocked. That one I could have I could have seen going either way. Okay. As far as Atlanta Green Bay, I think it's Matt Ryan's year. I think Atlanta's going to get it done. That offense, I mean, they have multiple backs. Julio Jones, like they have so much offensive firepower right. that if they get hot, they get going. And I just don't think Green Bay's defense is um, as is as strong as advertised. Okay. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, I understand, like he's a different deal, and you know he'll he'll play a heck of a game. But I I see Atlanta getting it done this year, and then I think the Patriots will crush the Falcons in the Super Bowl. Okay. All right. And then NBA, who do you have? NBA. Oh, it's going to be the trilogy. So it's going to be the uh, it's going to be Cavs and Golden State back there. Um, and this will be the first time in NBA history that two teams yep. th for three. Yeah, 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 for sure. So initially, when the Cavs signed Kyle Korver, part of me thought like, okay, he's a real shooter, real deal. This could be a missing piece. Obviously, it's still early, but they haven't had J.R. Smith. We just saw them lose by 35 and get owned by the Warriors. Um, so I don't want to be prisoner of the moment. Right. Maybe the Kyle Korver thing will get going. They get J.R. back. They get hot again. But I'm just coming off seeing that game. Right. 35. They got KD. I mean, I don't know. LeBron's own. Le, Le, KD's a worse nightmare as LeBron, though. Mm. It's like he's a different dude when he plays against him. Right. So, like, he, sh he shrinks. But I, I, I think the Warriors get it done this year. Right. And I know Stephen A. Smith throughout the summer talked to the whole world about uh -huh. his feelings about KD going to Oh, the, yeah. He, what, he, what is your take? He, do, you, he, do you think that was... He wasn't into it. Initially, I was like, stop it. I was like, is this real life? Right, I right. thought I got punked. I saw it on Twitter. And I, and I was like, this is the weakest move ever. But now how I've seen the whole things played out. It seems like him and Westbrook weren't that tight in their relationship. Like, they, they couldn't get it done together. So I'm like, but do Stephen you, Smith if that point, makes you happy. I get his point. His point is, all the teams is out there. that of all the teams out there, you know, you just lost to them. Had them 3-1. Yep. And, you know, you could go anywhere. You served nine years in Oklahoma City. I get it. But at the end of the day, he wants a chip. He's, you know, that's the place to be. And they just weren't going to get it done there. Um, do you think if he doesn't get the chip this year, yeah. that's bad. Right. He's got to win this year. Right. And th that probably says a lot about LeBron, about mm -hmm. what kind of player and how good of player he For is. For sure. I mean, the fact LeBron's that the best you're going to jump on league. that team. Just LeBron so is the best player. Yes. Or in the association. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, Valentine's is in a couple weeks. Uh -huh. I know you're currently in a relationship. Uh -huh. Lucky man. But... For my show, I wanted you to be my Valentine's. Oh. All right. I got a little something for you. I love it. Yep. I don't think I've gotten Valentine's since, you know, when you were in school, elementary school, and you'd, you'd give everybody in the, in the class little those heart. little cards, yeah, and, the, yeah, yeah. and the boy you'd like, yep. you'd give, like, the gushier one. I know. So thank you. You well, are so I, I sweet. Thank you for this being Chocolate. a guest on Chocolate. Um, Never go wrong show. with that. And before I let you go, um, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you want to be established at? In five years, I hope to, oh, this is tough. Five years, I hope to still be working in TV, mm -hmm. um, hosting a show that, that I'm passionate about, meaningful content that, that our viewer, you know, that viewers love, respond to. And I hope to be married. I hope to be a mother, mm -hmm. I guess those things. Right, right. Yeah. Now, 
a lot of people don't know you're from New Haven. You're uh -huh. born in New Haven. And I just want to say that anytime somebody's from New Haven who made a name for themselves, yeah. who's going to make a name, yeah. that's just a dream come true. And I envy you. Right? Oh, don't, I do. don't. No, I do envy you. Well, envy is not no, the right no, word. Aspire. No, no, you no, can say aspire. I, I, you know what? So for me, envy uh -huh. and jealous is different. Jealous means you hate and you don't like the person. Uh -huh. What they have or whatever. Okay. Envy means I respect the fact that you where you at. Thank you. So that's that's my opinion between jealousy and envy. So I Thank do envy you, you in that. Um, and there's a lot of athletes in New Haven, some uh -huh. who are in the NBA, who yeah. I, were on my show, who mm -hmm. I'm just so proud of. Because thank you. where you at, that's where I'm trying to be. So thank you again for of coming course, on the show. Of course, of course. I know you said for your New Year's resolution, you want to hopefully see the sun. Yeah. Any, anything else? Be, any for this? For this, like, what do you? New Year's resolution. I want to be. This is going to sound so cheesy. Um, like I'm. I don't know, reading an Oprah magazine, but I just want to be more present in the moment mm -hmm. um, in anything that I'm doing. So when I'm, you know, here, I'm only thinking about being here, right. you know, when you're off work, when you're at work, that kind of thing, and just continue to be better at my job and better in all my relationships mm -hmm. as a friend, as a daughter, all that kind of stuff. So you're growing like personally and, uh, and professionally, and I want to be happy. Everybody, this is Molly for First Take. I want to thank you again. Thank I want to thank you. my viewers. I want to thank my crew members and everybody here who is watching it. Um, we have live streaming it and Facebook, and yep. it will be aired next Thursday at 9 p.m. So we again, got Snapchat, Facebook, yes, yes, Instagram. Everything. Right? I don't do Snapchat, actually. Follow me on all of it. And you have a great day. And again, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank this you. This is the Mike Nice Talk of the Talk show. I'm here every Thursday at 9 p.m. Again, I want to thank my director, Connor, and my crew member, Leo. Catch me every Thursday at 9 p.m. Sign out. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Thank yeah. you so much. Why is adoption so important to you? What movie do you think you're going to be in next? So when you read that article about your son, how did that make you feel? It's the Mike Nice Show. So today we are going to talk about sports reporting. This is a segue. This is the sports reporting of the show we're going to do today. And basically, we're going to talk about who deserves the biggest award, which is the sport of reporting. Now, this is the award that all the sports anchors, all the sports reporters, sports analysts, sports broadcasts, they love. This is something that they want. This is something they keep over their fridge, over their fireplace. It's the sport, um, the sport of reporting. But before we decide who should be the sport of the reporter for 2020, we have different categories. So the first category is, I can't believe they said that. These are moments that sports reporters, sports analysts, even former NBA or athletes that become broadcasters say ridiculous things. And this is the award for them. And for the ones who are watching at home, a lot of sports reporters, a lot of sports analysts deserve this award. So we all have our own take on who deserves this award. This award is called, I can't believe they said that. And I think this award goes to, it goes to a lot of people. It could go to Steven, it could go to Skip, it could go, I think, even sometimes Shannon. <sighs> but at the end of the day, the person who takes it, Ryan Hollins. This, first of all, this guy, he's a former NBA player. He played in the NBA for like six, eight years, I believe. He was an average player. Below average. Below average. And now he's uh, a sports analyst. He says the most ridiculous stuff. Like, he may choke on his stupidity. This guy, and that's the problem with some of the former sports uh, athletes. They become sports broadcasters, and they think they know what they're talking about because they play the sports. That's not the case. This guy says the stupidest things, all right? Let me tell you. He said last year, in 2019, that Giannis, who plays for the Milwaukee Bucks, who's probably one of the best players right now in the NBA, top five in my opinion, he said last year, who probably had, not probably, had his best season, he said that he wasn't even an MVP candidate. Think about that. Giannis, not even an MVP candidate. He said last year in 2018 to the 19 NBA season that the Los Angeles Lakers was looking for their superstars. This is after the summer where they already got LeBron James. Now, mindful that, you know, they didn't have a great supporting cast. I get that. But he said they were looking 
for a superstar? What is not? What is LeBron? And I'm not even like the biggest LeBron fan, but what? What do you call LeBron? He, he's a mega. He's a definitely a mega star. Like this guy. Oh, and let me tell you this. Last year, 2019, the MVP of the league was Giannis. So he doesn't know what he's like. What is this guy thinking? So in my opinion, this guy, Ryan Hollins, you deserve this award. What? I mean, you, what are you thinking? What are you saying? Sydney, who do you have? I might have to agree with you. He says some some pretty off the wall things, but um, this guy, yeah. Nobody says more off the wall things than Skip Bayless. Okay. Here and better impact to Cleveland than LeBron James. It's We're, a ball statement. It's a ball statement. That's a stupid the statement. most crazy statement I've ever heard. Right. Johnny Manziel can't hold a candle to LeBron James in anything. Mm. LeBron James is better at probably walking his dog than Johnny Manziel. Waking like, up in the morning. Just, just being a, yeah, just everything. <laughs> right. Like, I don't, how do you even say that he's going to be a better impact than LeBron James? LeBron right. James has brought Cleveland the championship. The championship. Yep. He has brought more notoriety and more money to Cleveland Correct. than almost any athlete ever. Any governor. <laughs> yeah, any, well, any, yeah, yeah, anything yeah. ever. Yeah. So yeah. how do you even mention something like that? And that's not even the craziest thing that Skip Bayless said. Okay. You know, everybody knows Skip Bayless. Skip Bayless is a big, big T Tim Tebow fan. Yep. He once said that Tim Tebow is on the same level as Kobe Bean Bryant. Don't Google it. YouTube it. <laughs> it Don't Google it. YouTube it. Black that's Mamba? That's not outrageous. Black Mamba. It, the Black Mamba. Wow. Arguably the this. best basketball player. Arguably one of the best athletes. Absolutely. Ever. Absolutely. T we're talking Tim Tebow. Wow. Not even, not, not a Super Bowl. Right. Not, <laughs> not a playoff, I don't think. He, he won a couple playoff okay, okay. games. He won a play he, okay. he had a hot year. He had a hot okay. year. But he's Kobe Bryant. We're talking right. one of the most <laughs> ice cold athletes ever. Absolutely. You put him in the same sentence as Tim Tebow, that's just. So you think he deserves this just, award? That's just, that's just crazy. It is. That's just crazy. I mean, I love him. I love him. He's a good journalist. He's a pioneer to the game and everything. But this <laughs> war definitely goes to him. This is definitely the Skip Bayless award. Oh wow! All right, Easy. That's pretty, pretty, pretty tough words by our analyst Sydney Jasmine. Who do you have? So to quote my pick himself, I think it's blasphemous that mm. Stephen A. Smith has <laughs> not been mentioned. Mm. And Mike, I know that you interviewed him, and it was a great interview. But this guy is changing his answers all the time. Uh, there's been so many times he's changed his persuasions, he's picked his picks, um, and I have to say that I love watching him on television though. Mm. And I know that fans love to debate with yes. him. Yes. And because of that, I truly think that he's transcended sports. Flip flop. Okay. For Flip Stephen a. okay. Smith, right? So he says that uh, the Spurs are going to win the NBA championship and the Heat win. Then he says True. the Heat are going to win the NBA championship and the Spurs win. Right. So yeah, the, this award definitely goes to him. Okay. Uh, but also, I think we should focus on Will Keen. I mean, <laughs> this man uh, is an attorney who should be sued mm. for some of the outrageous things that he said. Touche, touche. Yeah. I made some good, valid points about both of those. Yeah, uh, my guy Will Keen out of it. He's a Dallas Cowboys fan. Uh, mm. Yeah, mm, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> the next category is never losing their cool. And this award goes to sports reporters, hosts, anchors, who never lose their cool in maybe awkward moments, tough situations. Sometimes the interviewee is disrespecting the interviewer and you have to handle yourself professional. Um, so this award goes to these sports anchors who really deserve it. Sydney, who do you have for this one? Um, I might be a little biased mm -hmm. on this one, just a little bit. Right. Um, because I'm from Connecticut, but the beautiful, talented Mike Molly Karam. Oh my, yes, talented, yes. She's she's amazing, honestly. To handle, she started out with on the show with Skip Bayless and Stephen A. Smith, mm -hmm. two very strong personalities. Correct. Very big egos, both always right, both always know what they're talking about. Right. Balance that, to be balance and control those egos, right. and then go from that to controlling Stephen A. Smith and Max Kellerman, mm. two different beasts right. of their own nature. And to control and manage those egos 
had to be. It's just, it's just remarkable, honestly. That is difficult. Let's not forget how classic she handled the LeVar situation. Ooh, yes. That was a bit. Yes. Ooh. That was I a, think they that was, banned him from ESPN, too, after that. Well, yeah, they were. Yeah. it was a bunch of stuff going on with yeah. that. But that was a, that was a, a, a very, very uncomfortable situation. And I feel like she, she, took her, she handled her cool. She kept her cool Absolutely. very well. She, 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 she made, what is the, what's the word? She made, remained um, calm, even kill. Calm, even kill. She was calm. She was cool, calm, collective. Right. And she just kept it going like it was nothing. She didn't, she didn't openly look like she took it personal, right. which I'm sure she did, right. um, along with her husband at the right. time, Jaden yes. Jayden Smith. So. Yep. Jalen Rose. Jalen I mean, Rose. Jalen yep. Rose. Um, so, so I can only imagine, but um, I think she definitely deserves it for all the everything. That's, and let's not forget. Point. Let's not forget. She is no no offense. She is a female. Let's let's not forget to be a female in a right. male dominated atmosphere. That is true. Sports. Um, that is true. Very that is true. definitely pretty, pretty remarkable. What do you think, Mike? You know what? I think this award goes to the legendary Chris Berman. This guy who's been on ESPN for over 25 years, he's been one of the first sports casters, first sports anchors. He's always calm and collected. I never see like a dull moment. Like he's always well put together. He's always professional. He's well known for covering the college football. He's well known for covering the NFL. And he always leaves his personal opinions out of things. Like, and that's one of the top things you need to be as a journalist, as a sports anchor, as a sports reporter. You can't really be biased, right? You have to really take it what it, what it is. And he has done that. And uh, he's been, like I said, an ESPN for over 25 years, and he has conducted and actually announced some of today's really significant games in the NFL and stuff. So I think this award goes to the legendary Chris Berman. His voice is just... His voice, yeah. His, his voice is just memorable. Like his, his voice is like Morgan Freeman. You don't you have just, you voices don't, like that. Yeah, you don't right. Need to, you don't need to see him to know that it's him. Like right. You can hear his voice. Oh, that. That's Chris Berman. Damn, okay. Man, that's, All right. I, I can agree with you on that one, Mike. And then what else? I might go left field with this one. All right. Uh-oh. Just a little bit. Uh, Christine Lee. Ooh. She has a YouTube channel. True. She has her own sports show called Fair Game. I, now, I watched her over the years. Mm-hmm. She's not the best. She's not the best. She's not the best. Right. But she has some iconic athletes on her show. Mm-hmm. Some iconic interviews, right. like that you can't look past. Um, it's been time where her guests would like kind of shut down her arguments. You know, they'll make valid points, right. points that obviously they sound better. You know, they right. sound better. Right. But she handled. She'd always handle handle the situation because she okay. always, you know, calm, cool. She was always straight with it. She was always. She always handled it very, very well. So. I, I think she got to take it. Christina? So Christi- yeah, Christine, though? I, I said left field. I said left field. She might not be the best, but when this type of award, never losing her cool, I think this might be her. Wow. All right. Well, that's a, a literal interpretation. Oh, well, that's a, that, you, that really is Respect left field. That's, that's, left, that's, cool. that's left field, foul ball, off the park. <laughs> uh, so uh, those were some of the categories. We're going to go to a quick commercial break. But before we go to a commercial break, we're just kind of going to share to you the biggest sport. Well, how much longer, man? He's going to be here, I promise. Well, you said that two hours ago. Listen, you have to do whatever it takes to get a good story, and I'm going to interview him, I promise. This got to be a little bit patient, all right? This, I'm gonna, we're going to interview him. We're going to interview him. We're going to interview him. Uh, he, he's coming right now. See, I told you. <laughs> Thank you again, Mike, for taking your time and conducting this interview. I do appreciate it. I want to wish you all the holidays. I know Thanksgiving and Christmas is coming up, so thank you. Uh, you are a well-known sports radio host, also a former NFL player. So what is something that you wish the lead had would have done in your era that maybe they already have done? Uh, probably cut down training camp like <laughs> like they're doing now for some of the players of the day. I mean, when I was playing, we would have two-a-days, full pads, you know, almost Almost every day of the week uh, and our camps would be four to six weeks long now they're in camp for maybe three weeks and they can't practice two days in a row in pads so you take less of a beating in the preseason so you have a little more energy for the for the regular season i think the nba now is calling that load management <laughs> that uh, the, you always have that lo- that term don't you yeah load management is interesting the interesting about that especially in the nba and really in the nfl if you try that is it hasn't been going on long enough to know if it's actually working right. it needs to be going on for 10 15 years and you need to do research, research with the athletes to to really see if it's having an effect now uh, america's favorite sport is football i would never really 
got into football because I was horrible at it. I played for like one week at Pop Warner. I quit. I got my money back. And I, re- <laughs> I remember I got a Nintendo 64 game with the money. Um, but my question is, do you think football would still be American favorite sport if they did playoffs and Super Bowls series? Best out of three, best out of four. Oh, yeah. It would still be the top sport. It's definitely the top sport. It's just too hard to do series in those sports. It's just too hard to to actually play that much. You know, now we're already talking 16 games, and then if you make it all the way to the Super Bowl, you're at 19 games. If you make those a series, you're looking at the low 20s for games. That might get to be a little much. But I get your point because sometimes one game, all of a sudden a few turnovers here and there, and and, you know, it's kind of out of your control at times. Now, the NFL nowadays, or not nowadays, but probably past few years, is kind of negative label with the whole Colin and even mm-hmm. some of the players being suspension and whatnot. What do you think the league needs to do to move forward to kind of have a positive light on the league? I think the league and the union need to get along better. When I was playing, Gene Upshaw was a former player, was the head of our union. And there was a really good relationship with the league and the players' union. Some thought maybe it didn't benefit the players as much because it was too cozy of a relationship. But it just seems like the league and the union today, they're they're always fighting. No matter what one says, the other side disagrees, and there's a little too much headbutting. I think it's getting a little better. You have a new CBA coming up in another year or two. I think mending that relationship a little bit, and it'll take a little bit at a time, but, but making those two entities get along better, I think is definitely going to be really good for the game. In my opinion, sports brings Americans together more than any culture experience, any music, any food. Sports really brings Americans together, and it's a big difference when you are focused not on the color of the skin, but the color of the jersey. I think that's a beautiful thing when people are like together and rooting for the same team. And I was just wondering, what else, if any, can sports do to kind of eradicate um, racism in this country, if, if any? Well, I, I mean, I, I think that's just it. I, my, my, a former player in this league and a guy who I worked in the, uh, the, the booth with for a number of years, Bill Curry. Bill Curry was a center for the Packers, and he was the center for Bart Starr, who was a quarterback. He was a center with the Colts for Johnny Unitas, one of the great quarterbacks of all time. And he talked about the huddle. He said the huddle is one of the greatest places in the country because it doesn't care about race, it doesn't care about religion, it doesn't care about anything. All it cares about is 11 guys working together for a common goal. And I always thought that was one of the best definitions that could work. I don't care if it's on a sports field, in a boardroom, in a classroom, anywhere. It does not matter what your background is if you can work with others for a common goal. My last three questions are, what is your favorite top story, sports story you have ever covered or even witnessed as a fan? Uh, I would certainly say a a Super Bowl. I mean, Super Bowl, and and one of the reasons I like covering Super Bowls is being a player, a former player for nine years in the league, whenever I go to the Super Bowl for that week, I always see a lot of former players, guys I played with and against, so it's kind of like a reunion right. every year for me to see those guys. So Super Bowl is always a highlight for me. Now, it was speculation and a lot of rumors and a lot of negative stuff when you and Mike went your separate ways, but at the end of the day, do you guys still talk? And what have you kind of learned from him as him being uh, a host um, on the show with you for so many years? Well, I think one of the things we learned is given time, you know, what a show can turn into. Listen, when we started, I hadn't done a show like that. Greeny hadn't done a show like that, but we were allowed to work through the early parts of that and the mistakes that you make, and kind of, they they let us grow. I think we had natural chemistry, which really worked, and that's something you can't really just invent. It kind of has to be there, and we were fortunate enough that it was there. Listen, we had had 18 years together. Did it end the greatest? No, it didn't end the greatest, but it doesn't take away from the 18 years of, of fun that we had, especially as young young guys just kind of starting out in it early on to them kind of being grizzled veterans when the thing ended. Absolutely. And last two questions are, what is your top three athletes of all time? And I know this is a kind of difficult question because people say, well, what era? So just to make it simplify, top three of any era and you could combine any era if you want, whatever you think your top three is. Well, I mean, you're going to go football. Uh, I watched before every one of my high school games, I watched Dick Butkus highlight reel. Because I was a defensive player, you know, just right. about my, my entire life. So I would watch this highlight reel before I went to my games. Oh, nice. and, and that kind of motivated me. I always was a Dick Buckus fan. I grew up in Cleveland, so 
It was always amazing. Leroy Kelly, the running back, always was a guy who I was intrigued with. And I, when I got to meet him later on in life, it was really very cool. And then another guy, I think, one of the greatest competitors I've ever seen. And when I started working for ESPN, I got to go do a story with him and sit in on a practice and watch him coach. And that's a great Dan Gable. You know, maybe the greatest wrestler of all time, one of the toughest guys ever, uh, to, to, to just watching not only him perform, but just his philosophy of, of teaching athletes, you know, not only the sport, but just about life as well. It's really impressive. Wow. And where do you see yourself in five years? Where, what's your vision like? Well, I'm not sure how much longer I'll do this. I may still be doing it in five years. If not, I'll be out in Arizona. I have a place out there, and I'm going to hang out out there and uh, with me and my wife. And I'll probably, I think in five years, I think I'll still be, I'll, I'm going to go back and call college football games. Oh, wow. I loved being in the booth for that, so I think I'll go back and do that and then just, you know, wait to play with the grandkids if I ever get any. And they say it's always difficult mixing business with pleasure. Obviously, now you are working with your son. So, does ever you have any tense moments? on the show and then you guys maybe don't talk for a couple of days or and how's that like kind of making that strictly professional and at the end of the day that's your son well we, we've never had one of those situations where we haven't talked and even though we work together and it's a professional environment he i have talked about my family since day one that i started doing the show way back with green and mike was 10 years old so mike jake sydney i've always made them part of the show so it's always been a little loose from that aspect I listen at the end of the day to work with your kid it's fantastic but I thought maybe he would be appreciative of my wisdom as an older person and it would be on bended knee right, right. saying father teach me right. but no he doesn't listen to me these stinking millennials don't listen to any of us we have to learn on our own I guess <laughs> Mike I want to thank you it's been an honor it's been a privilege I wish you best of luck I hope in the near future I will be in the same shoes I just i um, going to graduate this year with a sports journalism degree at Sacred Heart so my whole goal is hopefully to interview and, and, and cover stories like you so it's been a true honor thank you so much well I appreciate it very much you did a great job and all all I can say is advice is reps, reps, reps. Just keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you. And this is sports. Hey, to enjoy your favorite iHeartRadio podcast. Away and said, Oh, hell no. You know, it's a week. 
it was a painful process because I, you know, I was nervous about what he was going to do. Right. Not, not scared for me or anything like that, but you never want to be shown up on national TV. Of course, no, no, I totally. You know, in my opinion, the NBA has right now been the most athleticism uh, in NBA history, no doubt about that, in my opinion. But as far as the competition, athletes willing to compete at a high level the right way, I don't think it's at an all-time high, uh, especially for like the big names that are in the game. And I just want to know your take on that, on the NBA competition level right now, opposed to 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Or maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. I was just wanted to know your take. No, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I know that, it's, that the game has changed. Right. The yep. way you, you play the game, the way it's officiated has changed. And that's the way it's officiated has really changed the physicality. And you don't see teams playing defense like the bad boys in Detroit. Right. One of my favorite, favorite teams. Um, even Chicago and Jordan, you guys, mm-hmm. not the same as it was. It's much more of a finesse. Uh, outside in game, you know, an outside game is much more effective than the inside game. We don't have a lot of big men who have the ability of Shaq or Kareem or any of the other, you know, so I think that's changed. And so we have a lot more perimeter players. It's, it's very exciting. To see it, guys. No, it is. What, what James Harden is doing is pretty phenomenal. Right. Uh, what, and what Steph Curry is doing is pretty phenomenal. And I love watching those guys play. So I don't know if it's competition is any different because I think they're still very competitive, but I think the players are different. I don't know that there was anyone more competitive than Coach Bryant. <clears throat> Even, you know, Jordan was very competitive, of course. Right. But Kobe, Kobe was a killer. You know, he wanted to kill you. Right. And I mean that, you know, not literally, figuratively. No, I, I understand. Uh, yeah, okay, he had no... No problem sticking it in your face and, and winning the game. And I think that has changed. I don't see that in LeBron. Sometimes you do. When they came back from down yeah. 3-1 against the Warriors and won that series, we saw a lot from him. He was, he was phenomenal. So I think it depends on the circumstance. And the season is longer now, and it's just harder and harder to stay healthy throughout the season. Right. And I think that's a big, that's a big problem. And, and, and we both know, like you said, earlier that the game is changing the game is evolving evolution always you know takes its its course on on everything but i'm wondering how much do you think of it is it just strictly changing or is it strictly like for example we don't see too many big guys like shag and kareem and you know tim duncan like you said but how many how much of that is this the game changing itself or this nba scouts really not looking for big guys like that because that's not what the game is about that's a, that's a good question. I think scouts will will find a big guy if he can shoot. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's like a Dirk Nowitzki who can shoot from the outside and still play the inside game, they're going to find those guys. Those scouts work really, really hard. And they, the ones who identify talent uh, are few and far between, but they work really hard to find it. And they will find guys overseas. You know, like what Don I can't pronounce his name, Don <laughs> I can't either, so I'm not going to try. Better you than me. I know. <laughs> and uh, I'll run on and say that to me. Um, you know, you just, they work really hard. You know, look what San Antonio did in finding Ginobili and Tony Parker and um, the kids from Australia, and they, like Patty Mills. They went outside the box mm-hmm. of players, and True. they did a great job in identifying talent, and I think those are the teams that are going to succeed is the ones who have the best scouts. And I don't think scouts get enough credit. I really don't. Mm. The, um, what are what is your thoughts on the whole uh, Colin Kaepernick situation? Oh, I'm really tired of it. You know, I, Colin can do whatever he wants. I don't think he. I know they just settled with the league or whatever, but I don't think I don't think he was blackballed by the league. But I can't compete. Totally wrong on that, but um, I think the league would take you if you were talented mm. enough. I don't think they would care about the distractions. But again, talking about you know elderly white men who own these teams, so you don't exactly know what's in their minds and why they're thinking what they think. But I think the whole thing is um, I'm tired of it. I really am I'm tired of everyone 
talking about Colin Kaepernick. Right. Uh, but, you know, there is an element to what he did that people didn't like. But my problem with him was he also wore socks and had pigs on him, mocking the police. Police, yes, yes. And he wore a T-shirt and mocked uh, Cubans, Cubans in, um, in a picture of, of Castro on his T-shirt. I mean, it's just... He's not consistent. Um, right. It suddenly, you know, he, he, he knelt. I, mean, I believe that he was doing that, but you have to be consistent in your protest. You cannot one day wear socks with pigs on them and then claim that police have rights. You, know, you, you can't do that. So that's my problem with lots of societies that there, nobody is consistent with their. I don't think he's got it out. You know, and I think you've got to really think things out if you're going to cause that much fuss. Did you think he, 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 I know you say you didn't think he thought about, thought it out, so you probably think he had no idea of that, you know, this whole taking a knee was going to take him out of the NFL? I, I, I don't think that's what took him out of the NFL. Okay. I think the NFL, I think the NFL would take you if they find, I mean, they just, they just find guys who are, has been videotaped in domestic violence and mm-hmm. because they can quit. They can quit. Mm-hmm. So if they're going to do that, why would they take Colin Kaepernick if mm-hmm. they didn't think they could quit? Mm-hmm. Good point. So I think that I have nothing against Colin Kaepernick. I've, I've met him. I've talked to him. He's a fine young man. But I don't think he thought it out. Right. And I think that if he had been consistent, I probably would stand right or kneel right alongside him. But uh, I just don't think there was a, a consistency to his protest. Right. The halftime report. Mike Howard, also known as Mike Nice, has had a decent start to the film so far. But who is Mike Nice? What do we know about him? He's a local interviewer, but what else do we know? I have a clip that will help you understand a little bit about him and where he gets his passion from. so she may be a little bit cranky. Action! Cameras. Hello. We're not where we are. <laughs> mom, this is James. How are you? This is my mom. Hi, James. How are you? We told the viewers that you're not at your, her best, so... I love my mother with all my heart and soul. I'll do anything for her. She's my superhero. She saved my life, literally, growing up in foster care for the first four and a half years of my life was difficult. And here comes this lady, comes, swoops, and saves me and changed me and makes me a better person. So if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here. And and I'm in her debt forever. I always say that the interviewer I want to become is like Oprah. The leader who I want to become like is President Obama. But the person who I strive to be like every single day is my mother. Now we have a bond that can never be broken. The only one can get between me and you is us. And you're the only woman I can honestly trust. And you're the perfect person a woman should be. I'm looking for my queen, I don't like what I see You made it hard for me not to settle with thee Thank you for not making promises you couldn't keep Tucking me in bed, stories before I sleep Night show, the Mike Night show, the Mike Night show.
Jewish neighborhood. Right. And at that time, the opportunity came and... Uh... Mike wants to be the best interviewer, but he wants to do it in his own way. If you look at some of the guests that he's booked on his local show, it's amazing. The fact that he started his show in high school and he's still going, it's extremely ambitious. He will not take no for an answer. He's going to email, call, text, drive, whatever it takes to interview you. I love that about him. I don't think there's anyone in the world who has a local show and works harder than Mike. This is his life, his craft, and the show is a reflection of his hard work. He has had discussions about issues regarding his community and beyond. He loves New Haven, and he wants to make a brand for himself in New Haven that will resonate with everyone. Some people don't understand why his program is on public access. He doesn't get paid. He doesn't get sponsors. I don't even think there's any ratings. Mike simply does this because he loves it and through the passion and desire, he's going to grow it as an interviewer. He's been doing this for more than 13 years. When I first met Michael, all he wanted was a nationwide talk show. He said he wanted to be the next Oprah. That's all he would say. I have to have my own nationwide talk show. I've been the producer of his show for 10 years now, and his passion is still there. But now he's a lot more mature and disciplined. He's going to be a professor soon. His attitude towards going nationwide with the show has changed. He doesn't care if he obtains a nationwide talk show as much now, but as long as he can still interview everyone, he'll be satisfied. Mike wants to be a legend. 20 years from now, he wants to be known as one of the best interviewers. Although that seems pretty far-fetched, I believe as long as he keeps that desire, he will be a legendary talk show host. Mike, you have been producing your own show for 14 years now. What made you want to start a sports film? That's a stupid question. <clears throat> um, I've been doing my show for 14 years now, and I, you know, I wanted to try something different. Um, and I'm a sports fan, so I thought this was a great opportunity to kind of expand on something else. Mike, you have an impressive line of sport, sports anchors, sports journalists, Stephen A. Smith, Carrie Champion, Shelly Smith, etc. in this three-part film. How did you end up getting them? I emailed them. Can you expand on that? Um, sure. Um, so I have an email account, uh, ATNT.net, and when I couldn't reach them through the phone or social media, I emailed them. Mike, you don't look happy being here. I really just hear it because I don't want to be fine, that's all. From who? Who's going to find you? I don't know, CTV? I don't know. You recently stopped following CTV on social media. Can I ask why? No, you may not. I'm just joking. No, that's been a big deal for, for a few weeks. You know what, I just got logged out my account, that's all. Mike, you have had some amazing guests on your show. Who is your favorite? You know, you're a great reporter, I like you, but never ask that question again. So you're saying each show is your favorite? Next question. Mike, you have produced 300 shows over 14 years. The uh, last to speak to uh, Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. the first black person and only black person to interview Linda McMahon. Where would you rate this film amongst your accomplishments? You know, that's a great question. Um, you know, first, me being adopted, number one. Second, my education, and third, my show. But just talking about your show's success, where would you rate this film? I don't know. Um, they're totally different, so you can't really compare. But you had a few of them on your show, though. Why is this a tough decision? <laughs> it's not. It's, I don't like the question. You're still on local access. With your success, the guests you interview, don't you want to be on national stage? You know, I, I did at one point, but now that I'm 33 years old, that's not as important to me. Um, I have kind of matured. I mean, I would love to have a nationwide talk show, but that's not the bigger picture now. 
And uh, I just, you know, my goal now for 2020 is to become a college professor. But you are a great interviewer. Why settle for a professor when you can become bigger than that? Uh, I don't know if you went to school, but there's nothing bigger than education. You know, again, my passion is interviewing. I'm always going to have a passion for interview, but I have grown, mature, evolved into a different person than I was 10 years ago. What does that even mean? Let's say there were two bills. Red bill, you are a local successful interviewer who can interview anyone. But the blue bill, you become national talk show host. But everything you accomplish is erased. Which one would you choose? Somebody told you that my favorite movie is The Matrix. Nice. Doesn't it bother you that we, that with all the guests and success you had, you're still not nationally known? You all know me. That's what counts. Last question. Where do you see yourself in five years? Welcome to Mike Nice Talking to Talk. I am your host, Mike Nice, the nicest kid around. You know, I have been hosting and producing my own local show for 12 years, since my senior year in high school. Over 400 shows. I had the chance to interview some of today's influential and powerful people. But out of all the shows, out of all the interviews I have done, only three has caused me to sleep less the night before because I was excited about the upcoming interview. First one was being the last to interview Dr. Maya Angelou a week before she died. The second was Misty Copeland, and third is Linda McMahon. Well, last night marks the fourth night that I couldn't sleep because today, upcoming interview. Today, I'm interviewing ESPN, the one and only Stephen A. Smith. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I really appreciate you um, taking your time and conducting this interview for my viewers and I. Sure. And uh, definitely, I'm a huge fan of First Take. I try to watch it every day religiously. Okay, and thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. And it's ironic because this time last year I had Molly Kerm. She was a guest on my show. <laughs> and now I'm speaking to you. So please, you tell Max he's next. Okay. Tell him I'm coming for him. Or you can tell him yourself. <laughs> I try to talk to Max as little as possible. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> when you started your journey on becoming a journalist, did you think that you'll be where you are today? What was your original vision on starting to becoming a journalist? Um, you know, for me personally, it was just about making sure that I was great at what I did. Mm -hmm. um, starting out as a high school reporter, you know, even before that I was in college, uh, my professor was a critical and persuasive, uh, 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 he was the professor of the critical and persuasive writing class. His name was John Gates. He happened to be the editorial page editor for the Winston-Salem Journal newspaper while I was in college. And he had us write an essay and he looked at my essay and he came into class the next week because we had his class every Tuesday, and he said, you're a natural born sports writer. Mm -hmm. Let's have a conversation about that over lunch. Right. And so lunch was scheduled for the following Tuesday. I wrote it on one Tuesday. He gave me the results the following Tuesday. Then he asked to take me out to lunch the next Tuesday. And so, you know, that next Tuesday, we go out to lunch, and I'm looking forward to getting a nice meal. Mm -hmm. And he drives me straight to the Winston-Salem Journal. And we go upstairs, and in the sports department is the sports editor for the Winston-Salem Journal. His name was Terry Oberly. Mm -hmm. He took me straight to Terry Oberly's office, sat down with us for a couple of minutes, left us alone. Uh, Terry Oberly asked me questions about what my aspirations were, whatever the case may be. And literally five minutes later, he said, so when can you start? Mm. I was like, what? Right. He says, yes, when can you start? We'd like to hire you to be on our staff here, you know, do some ag material, do some other stuff and everything like that. And, um, you know, I was shocked, stunned and ecstatic all at the same time. Um, and I told him tonight mm. I'm ready to go, you mm -hmm. know, and I showed up and I was on a basketball team, I was on a basketball scholarship. I was taking 18 credit semester hours um, at Winston-Salem, majoring in mass communications and everything just took off from there. From that point forward, I was doing the regular ag material and the clerical work that came with the job. Uh, but, you know, within a week or two after meeting the staff and the copy editors around, all of whom were white, every single one of them, about a week and a half later, 
sports editor that tells me to go out to Winst to Wake Forest University, interviewed a soccer coach by the name of Walt Chiswick, who's now deceased, and um, he said, I need you to write an article on Wake Forest soccer. Mm. And they were ranked number three in the nation. Mm. And I walked out there, never covered soccer in my life, never watched soccer except once, which was the 1980 Olympics with Pele. That's the only soccer match I ever watched. I knew nothing about the sport. And I walked up to the coach and I said to him, I need your help. I want to be a sports writer, but I've never covered soccer, never watched it in my life. I know nothing about soccer. And he said, young man, I appreciate your honesty. He said, what does this article do? I said, Friday. It was a Monday mm. that I was there. He said, okay, and he called the entire team over and he said to them, you are to give this young man complete unadulterated access to the team over the next three days. Wow. We will teach him the sport of soccer. Right, right. And him and all the players, and I mean all of them, literally taught me the game of soccer. Mm. And I wrote a big two page pullout piece that went in the following Sunday's paper. And that Monday, Terry Oberly called me in the office. He said, congratulations. You're the new beat writer for Wake Forest Soccer. Wow. And everything just took off from there. And it just opened my eyes in a lot of different directions. So, I was so nervous. Actually, my crew and I, we were so nervous when we interviewed Stephen A. Smith. Because Stephen A. Smith's personality on TV is loud. He's outspoken. At times, he could be intimidating. So... We wanted to be on our A game. I wanted to be on my A game. I didn't want to waste his time. I wanted to be professional. And um, you don't have to agree with everything he says, but he is a great journalist. Uh, so I wanted to go in saying, listen, you know, my name is Michael. I'm a great interviewer, and this is why I want to be in the near future. And he gave us 45 minutes of his time. We did the interview in his office. And I remember I had one of my producers there. I had my camera operator there, and I was there. And I don't know how this happened, but the first two minutes within the recording, the camera fell over. And Connor, who was my um, camera operator, I love him with all my heart, but I was saying to myself, how did you let this happen? So the camera must have flipped over, so we had to do a retake. At that moment, I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh my gosh, he's probably thinking we're a joke. We're probably wasting his time. And I looked him right in the face and I said, Stephen, I'm sorry, we're just really nervous. I said it just like that. And he looked me directly in the face and said, don't be nervous, take your time, I'm human too. And when he said that, I was, it was a huge relief. And I was like, okay, he gets it. And I actually had my lavalier on my tie, and he was like, you know what, you need to put your lavalier on your jacket so you can pick up better audio. So he was giving me advice and tips um, throughout this whole little uh, camera f um, fallout. And at the end of the day, it was a great interview and he gave me his 45 minutes plus more because at the end of the interview we talked a little bit i was telling him that i was going to go to school for journalists or journalism and he was just a great guy so despite what we see him on tv he's a great guy so thank you stephen directions being a kid streets in new york city uh not exposed to the level of diversity that i was being exposed to at that particular moment going to hbcu um, certainly uh, not exposed to diversity to the degree that I was in that particular uh, in, in that particular situation in Winston Salem, to see so many people who look differently than me willing to extend a helping hand and to help me in a way that they've helped me, it's I always defer back to that as to what really jump started my career uh, because it elevated my level of hope because you grow up thinking about the odds being stacked against you, particularly when you're an African-American, you gotta do twice as well to get half as much and all of this other stuff. And there's some truth to that without question. Uh, but to see the generosity of people that look differently than you that were willing to extend a helping hand and to piggyback off of that and to still have the late great Clarence Big House Gaines helping you and, and so many of the African-American professors that did so much for me at, at Winston-Salem State University, it opened up my eyes and for the first time it wasn't just about bravado or confidence that I believed that I could achieve almost anything but it was the fact that I didn't have to rule out receiving a helping hand mm. from those who may have thought differently looked differently believed differently than me I recognized and it elevated my level of help of hope exponentially because I knew that chances were I was going to get a helping hand from other people. And that was really where my dreams started to really blow up. Do you think I knew everything was possible? Do you think you're a better journalist or interviewer? 
I'm going to always defer to journalism because I've always been about the information first. Um, I can interview folks, but if I don't have the information to interview them, how good is the information going to be? Mm. How good is the interview going to be? What am I going to talk to you about it? What questions am I going to ask you? What am I going to be in a position to try to peel out of you if I don't know what the hell I'm looking for? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to. I'm here waiting for Mike Nice to get done with his workout. I'm Leo L. Leo, sports guest with Surreal Sports Network Project. Snap. My boss told me I had to snap to it or write constipation commercials for the rest of my days. Mike! Mike! Later, later, I have, later, later. have a few words with you. Come on! Come on. Mike! Oh, please, come on! Come on, Mike! I have to feed my dogs Mike. right now, alright? This please. I, I, I know, Mike, yeah, alright. Right. Let me start a little bit. Come on there. Right. Come on, Mike. Come on. Mike, you know, please, I, you know Leo, you know we go way back, but... Uh, wait, I have to do this. Remember. I don't want to write constipation commercials the rest of my life. I understand that, but I just finished please. working out. Oh, like... I tell you. Oh, that's a nice painting. Oh. Anyway, hey, Mike. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Okay, come on, right here. Okay. I got to have this in here. All right, fine. How are you feeling right now? What are, what are your thoughts? To be honest, after this workout, I just... I am super hungry and I'm a little bit disappointed because I haven't tried the new Popeye's chicken sandwich. No, 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 Mike, no, no. I'm talking about your thoughts about the successful batting of the interview with Dr. Mike. Oh, that interview went really well. I actually was trying for months to get that interview. I was kind of doubting myself because it got rescheduled a few times, but at the end of the day, I didn't give up and I just kept on emailing his PR. Well, uh, there's some speculation that you actually lied to get this interview that you said you were a big hockey fan when in fact i have proof that you've never watched a game in your life and you claim to be a relative a distant relative of dr mike is there any truth to that you know that's not entirely true listen to get a successful interview like i just did you have to do whatever it takes and when i found out that a few people were really close on getting this interview <laughs> i stepped my game up so there, there is some truth to that huh all that matters is I just got this interview. Next question. Ah, uh, well, the big question is, I want to know, and I'm sure the fans want to know, why are you dressed in a, a basketball outfit in a shirt from Central that you never went to? Right now, I'm just full of emotions. And I just want to thank God, the Lord above, for, you know, giving me this opportunity and I'm relishing in this moment. Uh, Mike, why are you dressed like this? Anything is possible. Anything is possible! Anything is possible! Anything is possible! Oh, that's surreal. Leo L. Leo for the Surreal Sports Network Project. Snap! Oh, I hate doing that. So I wanted to know, what is the most challenging part about co-hosting a show? Is the chemistry opinion. with the other hosts. Right, knowing when to kind of lay back, when to kind of jump in. Right. Uh, the worst sounding show is when people are talking over each other, right. not listening to each other. But you don't want to make a point that maybe has already been made or is ignoring the point that somebody else was trying to hammer home. Right. So you have to listen and no, pick your spot. Don't feel like, I've got to get mine and worrying about yourself. You're worried about the show in general. So if that means this conversation I'm only talking 30% of the time or 20% of the time or 80% of the time, it's just knowing the right moment, knowing when to jump in, when to lay back, and making sure you're listening to the other two hosts. Did the chemistry work faster than normal than any other like radio or shows you've been working on in the past? Did you find that it was kind of quicker? Or was yeah, I, I think the reason the show works is because how quick. Right, you right. Know, uh, Michael and I seem to click right away. Right. Uh, and then you bring in Peter, right. and you would think, all right, here's a guy that's much younger than we are. Right. Uh, not necessarily a sports fan as much as he's a music fan, hip hop. There's a lot. He likes wrestling. He likes hip hop. I, right. I don't like those things. Right. <laughs> but it was just crazy how we just seemed to click as well. I mean, that that's really what I wish most program directors would realize. It's right. not just taking three people and throwing them together. It's right. making sure that it's the right three people together. That's what makes a show work. That's what makes a a sitcom work. That's what makes a band work. That right. they. They can intertwine and work together, and I think that it was immediate, and I think that's why it's really shown on the air. If you had to choose a sport and a sports journalist or a host or a reporter or analyst to have a debate, one-on-one -on -one debate that you haven't yet, who would it be? Well, that's a very interesting question because, um, you know, Stephen A. Smith is somebody that I've gotten to know, mm -hmm. but I've never really gotten into a heated discussion okay. with him over a long period of time. 
you know, that's certainly somebody I'd love to be able to, to have that debate that. with. I've been very fortunate. You know, the people that would jump at, uh, into the conversation would be Stephen A. Smith. Haven't I had a full-blown debate with him? No, but I've, I've, I've talked and we've been right. on the air together. Bob Costas would be another one. We, I've interviewed him. We've had discussions uh, together. Um, I, I think from a probably a commissioner, like to really get into it with a Roger Goodell or an Adam Ooh, Silver or a okay. Gary Bettman right. or a Rob Manfred because there's I find myself disagreeing with a lot of the things that they do. Mm, okay. You know, you look at what Manfred right now. I I thought the handling of the Astro situation was completely botched. Right. I'd love to be able to get his side and go back and forth instead of reading his side and giving my comments to be able to have that back and forth. Now Roger Goodell with the, with the relationship with the players it always seems to be contentious. Why? Uh, the growth of hockey with with Gary Bettman. Um, just why it works so well with Adam Silver. Mm. Um, the, the, those are probably four people that I would love to get into a discussion with. Now, in your early career, you worked on the Howard Stern show. What kind of like experience have did well, you well, bring? Well, work at Jace, I guess, because I interned there. Right. Uh, but I got to be around, you know, Gary Delavate and Robin Quivers, and got to meet Howard occasionally. Right. Although we were told when I first started working there, don't make eye contact with him, don't say hello to him. Right. Which was the same edict I got when I worked at the Fan with Imus. Oh. Um, Imus was mean. Um, Howard was nice. Right. So right. I, I right, found right. that it, it that it was unnecessary to have that uh, rule with Howard. Um, but it, did you learn anything? Have you? No. What I learned was just how hard they work. Right. You know, it's so easy to just say, boy, Howard gets all the breaks, right? He's got this huge audience. No, he works really hard. And, and being there early in the morning and seeing how early Robin and uh, got there and Gary got there and how the work that they did to kind of get it together, even for me to be on the perimeter as like an intern, interning on the music side, but also seeing him work and seeing the people around him mm -hmm. work, that that didn't come together on accident. That wasn't just a bunch of people talking for four or five hours and then going home. Those are people that really put the time in to make sure the show was at its best. So from a work ethic standpoint, I saw the sweat that those people around him put in and what he put in that really just blew me away and made me realize that it's not just luck. Right. It's not just showing up. It's putting it's in the working. work. Now, I was never good in football or hockey. I never was really good in either of those sports. I know how to ice gate but okay. I got backwards and I was a horrible mm -hmm. football player um, so but I wanted to know about what is it about one-on-one -on -one given play-by-play -play in professional hockey that gives that kind of passion or uniqueness to you that other sports maybe don't well I think it's just it's a love when you're a hockey fan you you find yourself defending the sport a lot because it's not talked about all the time mm -hmm. it's not covered all the time it's easy, I think, to follow the other sports because everywhere you look, there's information about it. Mm -hmm. Hockey, at least growing up, you know, what wasn't in the newspaper, I'd have to go to the hockey news or I'd have to find some other outlet to get it. And I found myself really falling in love with it. So when I call it, I just, I'm, I'm kind of happy to be there. Right, right. And I'm passionate because I love it so much and, and I want that to come across in the call. And I hope it does because it's just, I, I just love doing it. And plus, I was an athlete when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And it's the next best thing to being an athlete is doing play-by-play. -play. Mm. You know, most of my career has been analyzing the before and after. Right. During, we sit back and watch them play. But when you do play-by-play, -play, you're actually in the game. Right. You know, you're, you're, your work is during the time the clock while they're playing the game itself. So, right. And you get to travel with the team, and you get to kind of... You're not a player, but you're kind of there. Right. Where the media... And the people that cover it and the sports talk show hosts, which I am as well, are on the outside. But when I'm calling a game, I feel like I'm a part of it. And that, that makes me feel like an athlete almost. It just what makes it true, so truthful. Good. And last two questions are, the first one is, in my opinion, one of the greatest comeback sports in history is, you know, the Red Sox coming down 3-0, Muhammad Ali. Um, and I was curious to get your perspective on this is if we all have our views and our opinions on the whole Colin Cabinet situation. Mm -hmm. But if he does play and return next season or even in the future, would that be one of the greatest comeback sports in history? Uh, it would have to be because I don't, I'm not sure he can. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think football is the sport where you can turn away from it for, you know, three, four years. And, 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 that, back, and we're right, talking right. about someone that outside of throwing uh, for the scouts, I guess that was, you know, a few months ago. Right, right. With um, look, yeah, yeah. He, he hasn't played in a sport that you, there's so much you got to be able to do to be a quarterback right. and know that if he were able to come back, I would consider it one of the greatest, if not the greatest, because right now, if you ask me, can he do it? I would right. say no. I don't think he'd be able to do it. Okay. 
So if he did it, I'll be blown away by it because how how long can you go? Because we're going on uh, three, four, three, yeah, going yeah, on four yeah, years yeah, now. Yeah, That's a long right. time not to play. Right, right. Um, so I I, he, I would put the percentile very low. So just my instincts tell me that I'd be shocked. Right. So that would have to put it right up there as the one, of the you know, one of the one of the great because the guys that have come back, whether it's um, when Tom Seaver tried to come back, when um, uh, Jim Palmer tried to come mm-hmm. back, Guy Lafleur came back. They weren't gone for that long. True. Sure. To, to be gone for that long and to play quarterback and play it at the level that he was playing it at because this isn't a pocket quarterback. He, right. he was a, you know, his athleticism. Right. Those are things that I'm not sure that you can kick the rust off. I I'd love to see it, though. Right. That would be something to say. It would. Even when, I guess when, I'm not a huge football fan, but I guess even when Brett Favre came back for the last time, he was only out for, what, maybe two years, a year and a half when he came yeah, back? Yeah, it wasn't that long at all. Right, right. So I just, I just found that you know interesting if he does come back, like, would that mark that one of the greatest comebacks of sports? You're right there. Right, right, right. And then where do you see yourself in five years from now, like you personally? Do you still see yourself doing a show? Do you see yourself doing play-by-play? I see myself, you know, basically doing what I am now. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe getting a chance to do full-time play-by-play. I do about, you know, 30, 40 games. I'd love the opportunity to do it full-time. Right. You know, that, would be, that would be a dream of mine. Um, to see the show continue to grow the way it's growing, we're number one, but that doesn't mean that we feel like we can't get even better. better. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, like I mentioned before, about where do I see you know my my New Year's resolution to continue to work hard and always go after the next carrot. I've been very fortunate that I'm kind of running out of carrots. I've I've crossed the I've, I've checked a lot of boxes. Yeah, yeah. You know, which is great, but at the same time, to see that profile grow, to see that show grow, to see the play by play opportunities come back you know, though those are the things that i'd be striving for and hoping to get within the next five years i want to thank you so oh, much for pleasure. conducting this interview it's an thank honor you. i appreciate it and um i just want to say uh in the near future i hope to be in your shoes because i just got my sports journalist degree from sacred heart so i'm i'm excited and well judging by the job you're doing now i think you're gonna get there i appreciate it thank <laughs> you thank you hey thanks for watching the sport of reporting part one i hope you enjoyed the film and i hope I you enjoyed watch the end the credits his name George Khalil. You had one line, one line. That's it. That wasn't even your cue. All I'm right. Sorry, All right. Listen. I'm sorry. This is why I work alone. This I'm is sorry, why I work alone. I thought you wanted everyone knows this in your film. I, I do want everybody to know, but let's start from the beginning, okay? Let's just start okay. from the beginning. Okay. Cool. Oh my God. Whew. Hey, thanks for watching the Sport of Reporting Part One. I hope you enjoyed this video. <laughs>baseball football basketball okay. hockey but what surrounds the game has changed a lot just like we talk about managers and coaches right. today that don't run the show completely right what you're looking at today well uh, for me i was drafted by the new york Yankees. right and at that point i wasn't a big yankee fan i grew up a fan because i grew up in cincinnati but uh, now that i look back i wish i had played for the yankees uh, at the time of me being there in the minor leagues, uh, they were very congested with really a lot of good prospects. What they used to do is trade away, you know, three or four prospects for one legitimate major leaguer, and that's where the prospects got a chance to go to the big leagues. So that's what happened to me when I went to San Diego. Mm-hmm. But looking back, uh, the Yankees are the one team that I, I really wish I had played for. And the other, I think, would be the San Francisco Giants. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know why. Just it's kind of intriguing. Bay Area, nobody's been intriguing. Uh, I was one of the two players for Mike Campbell's Park. And of course, had my had been much younger, uh, I would love to play in AT&T Park. I think it's a good place. What are two major changes you see in the game of baseball um, from your era to now? One good and one maybe not so good. So what are like two changes you, you personally see um, that kind well, of stand out? Uh, I think the good thing first is the players are taking much better care of themselves. Uh, they're trying to do whatever they can in the off-season uh, to train, to get the most out of their ability. Uh, it used to be before the baseball, uh, you know, really it was only a part-time game. Uh, you played it during the 
summer 